Okay, this is a project watch that I just got. This is a vintage, obviously, Douglas, a skin diver. World timer, they call it. Pretty beat up. These are interesting watches because they're kind of collectible in a little way because I guess they've been reissued and they have a certain Neil Armstrong story attached to them. But they're a very, very cheap watch. Originally they were made, I guess, to be thrown away. This one's pretty beat up, so I'm going to see if I can if I can kind of bring this one back and make it kind of a cool, fun little watch. Okay, so I just removed the, um, the crystal to see what's underneath and uh, reveals the dial to be basically flawless. Um, I mean, it's, it's absolutely perfect. It, that looks like it's factory fresh. It, it's uh, shockingly good. The loom is perfect. Nothing is wrong at all with this. So uh, this is going to be um, this will be a, a rewarding project, I think. So this is the Douglas Skin Diver, and the back it's one of these crazy backs that wouldn't come off. And um, you can see kind of quite a few little marks from where people in the past tried to get it off with no success, I guess. There you can see it's pretty badly bashed up. So I did the uh, trick of gluing, crazy gluing a nut to the <laughs> to the top. Uh, this was actually really old Gorilla Glue, so I wasn't sure if it was going to work. And because uh, it's still kind of soft, actually. So, so uh, but then I let it harden for a few hours, and then I gave it a twist, and it did work. So this is actually the first moment I'm going to be seeing, and this is not set up for the video here, so I have no idea what to expect inside, but uh, this is the moment of truth. Um, well, it looks like stuff did get in to the watch at some point. That's crap on the back there. That's okay. And here is the movement itself, uh, as expected. It's a Cadden C66 movement. These are really cheap movements. Um, one jewel. I can already see that uh, this stuff here, these are like just steel bearings. So just a lot of steel on steel. And I think the movement slides around. Yeah, so it's, it, it, it's just, I think it's just, <laughs> put into the uh, into the case in the most rudimentary of ways, just pressed in there and held by the stem and maybe those. Ooh, that looks like it might be, uh, yeah, it's not, definitely not right with the balance. It's, um, that's a lot of, that's probably a broken pivot. We shall see. Undoing the crown wheel screw now here, and it does unscrew uh, clockwise, which is typical of crown wheels, but generally they give you the warning with the uh, three lines on the screw, so do not forget to do this one clockwise to unscrew.
Something interesting about these lesser priced movements is that rather than using the cannon pinion as the friction area for setting the time, it's actually done right on the main barrel itself. It's kind of a neat method and actually makes it easier to take these watches apart than having to pull the cannon pinion. And here we have the first problem, which is a broken pivot. Continuing to the pallet fork, which on this is actually a pin pallet. So it is uh, the most rudimentary of forks, but works. Continuing to the dial side, start pulling apart the plates and parts that make up this side. Again, a very simple, movement, as basic as it gets. The cannon pinion is not attached there because the clutch is actually um, on the mainspring barrel, which is pretty cool. Something I like about these movements is their absolute simplicity. Um, I find something beautiful in their kind of brutish simplicity as the keyless works here uh, demonstrates quite readily. I love the watch this simple can run and tell the time just like a $10,000 movement. As you can see the jewels, if that's what you want to call them, are uh, just hunks of, <laughs> hunks of metal. So now begins the portion of this fix, which is the, uh, the new uncharted territory. So removing the entire balance wheel with its uh, pressed in roller, again, because it's such an inexpensive movement, and uh, doing what you generally don't want to do, which is replace the balance um, with the original hairspring without vibrating the hairspring. That can be uh, um, prone to error. But with this watch, uh, all bets were off. I was able to purchase a bag of balance wheels from India, and uh, after sorting through them, there were a lot of broken pivots among those found uh, balances with good pivots. And so now I'm reattaching or attaching a new balance wheel to the uh, hairspring. The hope being that when I put it all back into the watch, everything will run and that will be a nice fix. back. Um, I marked the balance wheel to uh, hopefully have the roller in the right position and so trying to get it in and uh, here seeing that it's um, unfortunately so out of beat that it's not running so that means that I do have to adjust the roller. the collet this can be uh, this can go wrong very easily if that screwdriver slips so you really want to be very careful because you can destroy a hairspring very easily doing this so once it uh, ooh, don't stick once it's back see if we can get the watch going
and that's always a pleasing thing when the balance starts ticking away like that. Unfortunately, putting the watch on the time grapher gave me no reading whatsoever. So I then took the watch and timed it with another timer by the minute and found that the watch was running three seconds slow per minute, which is a tremendously slow rate. The regulator has absolutely no effect on this, so something bigger is going on. And after a lot of determination, it seems like there really can only be one reason as crazy as it seems. The hairspring is too long. I'm going to actually try to shorten the hairspring, which I think is probably not going to end well. The hairspring is pressed into the pin, so very carefully pushing and pulling and doing it in such a way that I wouldn't be bending the hairspring, I was able to push it through. And little bits, little bits of push, ever so more, and it starts to read better in terms of the timing per minute. Still no reading on the time grapher. So continuing to shorten the hairspring by pushing it through the stud and eventually getting to where the watch does read on the time grapher. I did this about six times absolutely shocked by how much shorter that hairspring had to be. I never thought that it would have to be shortened to that extent. Okay, so that um, that may not be what you typically think of as fantastic uh, lines, but in the case of this, I will absolutely take it. It was only after the watch started telling time properly that I dared to actually trim that hairspring, because there's no going back once you've done that. I pulled close to an inch of hairspring off. So this watch never ran right out of the factory, which is probably why it's in such good condition. It was a useless watch. Uh, so it's remarkable that 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 it would not, that it would be, uh, this isn't even close. I mean, we're talking about a huge amount of hairspring had to be removed in order to get it to, uh, get close to beat. I don't have any way of vibrating a hairspring here, but I did get it close enough uh, that it's reading on the time grapher, which it never did before. And uh, I believe it's gonna tell pretty accurate time. So I'm gonna let it run on the wrist for a couple days and see what happens. If it works properly, I'll disassemble it and really clean it up because it, in all the work, it, it got quite dirty again. So I'm very pleased, even though it's a very inexpensive watch. Uh, it is a vintage watch. It is a classic, it is a collectible now. And, uh, and you can actually use it to tell time. So that's, that's a win.